and welcome to Bad Book Club, where I, Jade, a silly goose with an English degree, read classic and popular literature so you don't have to. Hello friends and welcome to this episode of Bad Book Club on Where the Crawdads Sing. I'm super excited to talk to you about it because, let's face it, I always am. But before we jump in, I just want to do some announcements. So this week is a little wonky because my husband and I are moving to a new apartment. And we just got in, some of our stuff is unpacked, I'm really excited, it's a great new place. But our studio has been moved and... It's now at home, which is wonderful, but we're still getting it set up. So if I sound a little different, that's why. Thank you for bearing with me. And since it's a move and everything was a little hectic for a couple days, I am a day late on this episode. It should never happen again. Um, And I'm also going to be splitting Where the Crawdads Sing into two episodes. And don't worry, you won't have to wait a full week for the next one. It should release later this week. It just makes it easier on me to kind of chop this into tiny little pieces instead of doing it all at once because it's a long book, first of all. And two, it just makes my week a little easier to plan while I'm unpacking and figuring out where everything should go because it's a lot of trouble. Um, And last announcement, my cat is now where I record, and she is very upset that I've put her outside of the room. So if you hear little cat meows, it's because she's sitting outside, very upset I won't let her in. So (laughs) I apologize for that if you can hear her, but thanks for bearing with me. So we can jump in. Let's do this. So this book, Where the Crawdads Sing... I feel like I've seen it everywhere, but you may or may not have heard of it because you may or may not be a huge book nerd like me, (laughs) but it doesn't matter that much. I'll tell you everything you need to know. So before we jump in, let me give you a little rundown about what it's about. So here's the dust cover. Are you ready? Get yourself ready. Okay. For years, rumors of the Marsh Girl have haunted Barkley Cove, a quiet town on the North Carolina coast. So in late 1969, when handsome Chase Andrews is found dead, the locals immediately suspect Kaya Clark, the so-called Marsh Girl. But Kaya is not what they say. Sensitive and intelligent, she has survived for years alone in the marsh that she calls home, finding friends in the gulls and lessons in the sand. Then the time comes when she yearns to be touched and loved. When two young men from town become intrigued in her wild beauty, Kaya opens herself to a new life until the unthinkable happens. So interesting, right? Some fun facts about Delia Owens, the author. She published this book in 2018, and she has a bachelor's in zoology, and she's a PhD in animal behavior, so she knows what she's talking about. She also spent some time in Africa with her family and uh, studied animals there, which is super cool beans. So this book is very official and tells you actually interesting information about animals that I found really interesting and fun. Um, And there's more to that story that I'm going to touch on in our discussion that gets a little wild, but I'm going to keep it to myself because I don't want to spoil the ending for you. And before we jump into our summary, I just want to give you some background information because this episode will be a teeny, teeny bit different than my other ones just because of the way this book is written. So first fact about this book is that its prose is different. By prose, I don't mean pros and cons. I mean P-R-O-S-E, which is just the writing of the book. It's different because this one's much more flowery. It talks a lot more about the scenery of the marsh, and it's very poetic and beautiful. And I do like that. I have some opinions about it as we keep going. But since there's so much of it, I don't think I'd be able to give you a well-rounded feel of this book without including some of those excerpts. So I will be including more excerpts in this conversation than I would usually do. And fact number two about this book is that it is, it follows two timelines. It follows Kaya starting in 1952 when she's six years old as she grows up, but it also follows 1969 and the death and discovery of Chase Andrews and his, you know, alleged perhaps murder. So we're going to follow two timelines here and I will tell you when we're switching timelines, but there's going to be a lot of years and I'll be as clear as I can be and not confusing as possible because when I was reading, my eyes would kind of skip over those years and I'd get confused, (laughs) but I will keep it as clear for you as possible. So why don't we finally jump into the summary because I've been talking for too long. Am I right? (laughs) Let's go. Jamaica, 
Bahama, come on, pretty moon. I don't know the words, but that song stuck in my head. So now it's stuck in your head. You're welcome. Anyway, the way that this book starts is with a prologue that's very short that I'm going to read to you that I think will set the feeling for this book in a way that nothing else can. Are you ready? 1969. Marsh is not swamp. Marsh is a place of light where grass grows in water and water flows into the sky. Slow-moving creeks wander, carrying the orb of the sun with them to the sea, and long-legged birds lift with unexpected grace, as though not built to fly, against the roar of a thousand snow geese. Then within the marsh, here and there, true swamp crawls into low-lying bogs, hidden in clammy forests. Swamp water is still and dark, having swallowed the light in its muddy throat. Even night crawlers are diurnal in this layer. There are sounds, of course, but compared to the marsh, the swamp is quiet because decomposition is cellular work. Life decays and reeks and returns to the rotted duff, a poignant wallow of death begetting life. On the morning of October 30th, 1969, the body of Chase Andrews lay in the swamp, which would have absorbed it silently, routinely, hiding it for good. A swamp knows all about death and doesn't necessarily define it as tragedy, certainly not as sin. But this morning, two boys from the village rode their bikes out to the old fire tower and from the third switchback spotted his denim jacket. So that is a really good example of her prose writing. I do think she worked harder on this section than she did in the other sections, simply because there's a lot of alliteration here. Alliteration is just simply using a lot of words that start with the same letter. It makes it sound really poetic. So there's like low lying bogs in this layer. It's all L's and that kind of thing. Basically, she uses a lot of it here and sometimes she uses it in the novel, but it's really heavy here. So I feel like she really took time with this intro to make it sound beautiful. And I think it is. It's really nice. It's a really nice opening. And it tells you exactly what this book is like from the very start. There's going to be a lot of marsh and swamp. And there's going to be some descriptions of Chase dying and some descriptions of sciencey things and that kind of thing. It's a pretty good mix. So I do think it's important to tell you that the marsh versus the swamp is kind of an important bit in the book that I didn't even see till the very end. The first part of the book that we're going to be covering today is called Marsh, and part two will be called The Swamp. So from this little excerpt, I think you can tell the marsh is a good thing and that the swamp is kind of not. So that's part one and part two. I don't know if you can hear my cat, but she's very upset that I'm in. I'm sorry, pretty girl. It's okay. I'm recording. Can I talk to you later? She's upset. Her name is Willow, and she's very cute, but she's also very demanding. Okay, so uh, let's jump into the actual story, because now I've been talking for far too long. The book starts out in the worst possible way by breaking my heart, which is extremely uncool, but basically it starts out with Kaya, who's six years old. We're in her kind of, not perspective, it's like you're watching it. It calls her Kaya and she, not I. Um, and it kind of jumps into everyone's heads. It's called third person omniscient because I'm a nerd. So I know that. So Kaya is watching her mom in her fancy gator heels, which she doesn't wear often, carry a suitcase and walk down the lane. And she doesn't look back or wave or anything. So it's pretty much clear that Kaya is watching her mom leave forever. Like she's not planning on coming back. She doesn't ever turn around to say goodbye. Nothing like that. Kaya turns to her brother, Jody, who says, don't worry, she'll be back. And Kaya's like, okay, I mean, I don't believe you. She normally doesn't leave with her gator shoes, but okay, I trust you. And we learn that Kaya is the youngest daughter of five, which is a lot of children. It mentions that this is the year 1952, okay? That night, their dad comes home drunk, so I feel like I know why the mom left. And his, her sisters make food for dinner. That night, she goes to sleep on her porch bed. So I get the feeling we're living in poverty here. This is, you know, depression era, living in a shack on the marsh. Her mom leaves. Like, this is, this sets a tone for sure. And it's not a great one. 
That morning, Kai mentions that when they woke up, her mom didn't make breakfast with the usual zeal that she normally does, dancing to their radio together. This time, she had like a scarf on on her forehead. You could still see a bruise there. So their dad is obviously abusive, which sucks. Kaya keeps waiting for her mom to come home. She stands at the end of the lane where their shack is and stares and hopes that her mom will come home at any time. And she does this over the next couple days. And Jody, her brother, tries to distract her. They race on the beach and they play pirates and all that. So it's a big bummer. But what's an even bigger bummer is what comes next. In the next chapter, her three older siblings leave. I guess they've had enough of their pa, which is what they call him. And three of them, which we learn their names or what she calls them, are Missy, Murph, and Mandy, two older sisters and an older brother. They leave, and it's just her and Jody now. And one morning, they're making breakfast together, and their pa comes in and is acting, you know, slurred speech, drunk, obviously. Jody tells Kaya to go hide, so she does, and Jody shows up on the beach later, and it's obvious that her dad punched him. And he says, look, I have to leave too. Like, I can't stay here. I'm really sorry. And he leaves too. He leaves this six-year-old by herself. Her whole family has left this six-year-old by herself with an abusive father, which was just shocking. It's the very beginning of the book. What are you trying to do to me? I'm so sad and I just started this, but what can you do? Anyway, that night she tries to cook. It doesn't go super great because she's six, but she tries to eat. Her dad's gone for three days. In those three days, she can't find any eggs from the chickens and like she's having trouble eating. And for the most part, she tries to stay out of the house and clean and in general, not be noticed. Eventually, her dad does come home and he burns most of her mom's things, including the radio that they cook with in the morning, which Kaya is so upset about. She even runs up and says, no, stop. And her dad almost backhands her like his hand is lifted. And then he shrugs and goes into the shack. So close call. This book so far starts with a direct punch to the stomach and that's how you're introduced right after you learn that there's a dead guy. So that's how this book starts. It's a little rough to be honest with you but it sounds rougher in summary because she has these beautiful excerpts that are in the middle between all these things and I'll be telling you more of these excerpts as we go on. So anyway let's keep going. At the start of the next chapter, Delia Owens gives us, the reader, a little bit more information about their family, mainly Pa. She mentions that her Pa fought in World War II and hurt himself, hurt his leg. And so the army, you know, pays him weekly because he was, you know, discharged with an injury or whatever. And that's where he gets his money from. Then he puts this money down in front of the six-year-old one morning and says, go get us groceries, and then goes off somewhere and leaves this poor girl to go into Barkley Cove, the closest town, by herself. I'll remind you that she's six and that this town is over three miles walking, and she has to walk because they don't have a car. And so she walks over three miles barefoot in tiny overalls to this town, And in this town, she says that there's only like two streets and on one is the Piggly Wiggly. She spends a long time talking about the streets. And then this older kid almost runs her over with his bike. She tells us this is Chase Andrews. Yes, the same Chase Andrews who's found dead in 1969. He and his friends are riding their bikes and almost hit her. And this woman comes out of the store and calls her swamp trash, which is super sad. And then she goes into this grocery store and buys grits that are on sale so that she can eat food for the week and uh, her dad didn't give her any guidance on what to buy she just bought what her mom normally gets so that is so sad and I'm at this point I'm like why is no one helping this poor six-year-old everyone's just being so mean and calling her like names instead of actually helping her and so Mrs. Singletary the uh, checkout lady helps her make change because she can't count because she's six this girl is six years old Just some impressions at this point. I uh, really like that counting scene because I feel like it's really accurate for a kid 
to not understand small stuff like that. Like they try their best, but the world's a big place and they don't get stuff like that. Like I distinctly remember when I was younger, my mom once called me over to like teach me how to count money. And she was like, yeah, so you look at the numbers on the thing. And I was like, no mom, I've got this. And I sat down and I just took the pills out of her hand and went one, two, three and counted the pieces of paper and then went bye and hopped off and ran away. And they were like, that's not how you count cash, but that's how I counted cash when I was six. So the childlike aspects in this book so far have been really accurate. And when I was writing out this summary, I was like, wow, so many of my books have childlike aspects. And I was like, right, it's because I'm doing coming of age stories. And I think it's so interesting the number of ways you can write a coming of age story, which is just about a person growing up. And I really like that most of them have been really accurate in terms of what it's like to be a kid, because I don't know, I feel like some adults forget what it's like to be a kid. And it's nice to know that there are people out there who remember it accurately and are able to portray it well. And I think that that's a pro in this book because she's young for quite a while. The other thing I've noticed about this book so far is that the flowery talk and writing can be a little much and she tends to ramble on about stuff that I don't think matters. Personally, this book, when it rambles on about places that are not the marsh, I don't find it interesting. So if it's the marsh and you're telling me about the pretty flowers and the geese and the pretty bugs in the air and all those things, like I'm happy to pay attention. But when you start to ramble on about all of the different stores that are in Barkley Cove, I'm like, okay, I don't need to know this information because it's such an easy way for me to feel disconnected to the story. It's one of those things where it's hard as a writer to tell the difference between setting up a world that's believable and gives you information versus a world that is too much just useless information. And I feel like the way that you do that normally or the way I would do it is by sensory. So it's like, oh, I feel the street under my toes would be an easier way to ground me in the scenery and the setting rather than just telling me all the stores that are on the streets. So that's just one issue I have with this book. Just in general, every time we're not in the marsh, when she does the super flowery descriptions of what's around her, I find them a bit distracting because I don't need to know the super flowery world of a main street. I don't need to know that. Like, I don't need to know what year the Piggly Wiggly was put there. Just things like that. But overall, the descriptions of the scenery at the marsh have been really beautiful so far. Sorry, guys, I'm feeling a little rambly today. Let's get back to the actual story. So she gets home from the grocery store and tries to make grits, but it doesn't work out because she's six and she doesn't know how to make grits. If you don't know what grits are, if you're not like from a southern state like I am, they're kind of like weird things that you can boil and they end up being kind of similar to mashed potatoes. They're extremely cheap and I don't know how good they are for you, but it's definitely a southern thing. You should Google it if you've never heard of it before. They're pretty good. I like shrimp and grits personally because... I'm a monster. But anyway, let's move on. She doesn't know how to make grits. She cleans the whole house. She does her laundry with like rocks and a spigot. And then she tells us that she's just trying to avoid paw, which is, that sounds like a good idea. I support that choice, Kaya. (laughs) At the end of the chapter, she mentions that it's the autumn moon. And her mom always told her that on the autumn moon, it's her birthday. And so she realizes that she's turning seven. She's positive her mom will come home for her birthday and she waits at the end of the lane, but her mom doesn't show up. And so she goes to the beach and feeds the gulls there and tells them that it's her birthday today, which is just such a heartbreaker. This poor little girl. Oh my gosh. Why do they do this to me? Why do books make me feel this way? Okay, let's move on. Flash forward to 1969. This is the prologue again. It kind of does it over, but in more detail. Two boys find a dead body near the fire tower, which is like super old. And they get Sheriff Jackson from the town nearby, Barkley Cove, and he gets Dr. Murphy, and they know Chase personally. So while they normally ignore Marsh stuff because it's just Marsh people killing each other is what he says in the book, he decides to go because this is Chase. While they're there, they look around and they realize they can't find any footprints belonging to anyone. So not even Chase. Like, they don't know how he got here. All in all, it seems suspicious. We return to 1952 to young Kaya. 
One day, a woman shows up in the morning and announces herself as Mrs. Culpepper. She raps on the shack door and says, you know, come here, Catherine. Like, you have to come to school. I'm the truant officer. She promises that if she comes, she'll get food, really good food, like chicken pot pie. So come. And Catherine, or Kaya, as we've known her previously, comes forward and says, okay, that's me. And she gets ready and her little dress has to be held up with a safety pin. And she gets in the car with this woman and goes to school for the first time, which I wasn't expecting and sounds really scary. They put her in second grade because they don't know how old she is. And then on her first day, she stands up and her teacher announces her to the class and asks her to spell dog. And she spells G-O-D, which is actually pretty good, like, for a girl who has never been taught anything before. But so sadly, the whole class erupts in laughter. And while the teacher quells it, it still is such a such a sad experience for Kaya. She mentions that after that, she goes to lunch. She has chicken pie, but she doesn't really have an appetite. And she saves it in a little milk carton that she finishes. So she drinks the milk and then puts it in the carton and puts it in her pocket. And then she's watching all these people around her, and it's just so obvious that she's just different from them. On the bus to go home, the driver mentions that he has to drop her off three miles from her place because otherwise the lane is too sandy. And as she gets off, all the students make fun of her and call her Marsh Girl, where's your stupid Marsh hat? And like say really mean things, and it's so sad. She goes home where her pa is not there, and she runs to the beach, and she sits with the gulls and sobs and feeds them her food from the day and just feels so sad. It's just so sad. And then the next day when the truant officer comes, she hides. And then the day after that. So she has decided she's no longer going to school, which I wasn't expecting. I thought that she'd go back, but she just decided she wasn't interested, (laughs) which I guess if I was six, I don't know if I'd be interested either. So my bad, seven. Anyway, the next day she is playing on the beach and she jumps off a tree and steps on an old rusty nail. Ooh, not great for a seven-year-old who is not near a town and probably has never had a tetanus shot. She knows about tetanus, however, from some sort of story that she was told. And so she walks in salty water for a little while and is in general really stressed. But after three days, she goes, yay, I don't have lockjaw, because I guess it takes three days to be sure that you don't have it. I'm not sure. And anyway, at the end of this chapter, she has decided that her mother still hasn't come home after all these harrowing things that have happened to her, and the marsh becomes her mother, which sounds weird when I say it to you, but it sounds really nice in the book, so I'll read it to you. Months passed, winter easing gently into place, as southern winters do. The sun, warm as a blanket, wrapped Kaya's shoulders, coaxing her deeper into the marsh. Sometimes she heard night sounds she didn't know, or jumped from lightning too close. But whenever she stumbled, it was the land that caught her. Until at last, at some unclaimed moment, the heart pain seeped away like water into sand. Still there, but deep. Kaya laid her hand upon the breathing wet earth, and the marsh became her mother which is pretty sad, right? But it's also really well written. Flash forward to 1969, the sheriff and the doctor are still at the fire tower. They mention how suspicious it is that they can't find footsteps and how there's a grate open in the fire tower. So I guess when you go up the stairs, there's a bunch of grates in the floor and one of them is open. And I think that's suspicious for some reason. I would assume that it's just exactly how he died, but they think that that it's suspicious because normally these grates aren't open, so... What can you do? They also mentioned that Chase was a ladies' man and that he was the quarterback of the town and that there were some people who didn't like him because he got around, you know? And they also mentioned that if someone did push him through this grate, they'd have to be strong to push him through. Like, they'd have to be really strong. And then we're done with 1969 for that chapter. Let's head back to Kaya, the girl I really care about. This chapter starts off with Pa telling her that he's going to leave to talk with Army, quote-unquote, about money because they owe it to him. Kaya is so scared that someone else is going to leave her that she's actually scared about her Pa, who's not really her friend. He walks to the end of the lane, and he actually turns around, and she's so excited he turned around. She, like, waves enthusiastically, hoping he'll wave back, and he kind of lifts a hand, and she's just overjoyed that anyone showed her any slight affection or any sort of 
hint that they would return, which is so sad. Now that he's gone, though, she decides this is the perfect time to go out in his boat. I guess he has this small boat, and she has gone out in it a couple times with Jody in the past, her brother, and has decided that this would be a good time to go and do it again. She has to be careful, though, because... Pa will notice if any gas is missing. So any gas she uses, she has to replace. She decides to go out. So she's going through all these little waterways and she goes out into an estuary and she realizes that there's a storm coming and she sees a boy fishing there. She avoids this boy because she's like, ooh, dangerous, and decides to avoid him. But then she realizes that she's lost. She does not know how to get home. And so she, as a last ditch effort, finds the boy because the storm is coming. She needs to get home. She finds the boy. He's fishing. And he says, hey, like, I know you. You're Jody's little sister, Kaya, right? And she's like, yeah, how do you know me? And he's like, well, I used to hang out with you guys sometimes. We would fish. And she goes, okay, well, do you know where I live? Like, can you show me the way home? He's like, yeah. And he boats her home and waves goodbye. And it's very cute. After that, we actually follow Tate for a hot minute. That's his name, Tate. The boy's name is Tate. We follow him home to his dad, Scupper, which is a cute name. He's like a shrimper. They make burgers for dinner, and he mentions that his mom and his sister are gone, like passed away, and that poetry is something really important to him and his dad. So from this little excerpt, I get the feeling that we're going to see more of Tate in the future, and that he's a really nice guy, and that his dad, Scupper, is a really cute dude. So... And Kaya is home safe and sound out of the storm, so this was an adorable chapter. However, we still have some unfinished business. You see, Kaya has to buy gas for her father's boat or else she's going to be in trouble. So she cleans the whole house and buys gas for the boat and tries to get some groceries. She doesn't get any milk so that she can buy gas. And she almost doesn't get any gas because the guy calls her swamp trash and almost doesn't serve her, which is so sad. This is a little girl. Give, Give her the stuff she needs. She has money to pay you. What's your problem? And she's doing all this because she's hoping she can convince her father to take her out on the boat with him because she loves the boat, but she doesn't know how to work it or anything about the swamp slash marsh. She doesn't know anything about it and she wants to know more. So she's hoping she can convince her dad to take her. So one day, Pa gets home and she's made dinner. She's made like rib backbones or whatever and he's actually really nice and surprised and she tried to make cornbread and he has some and she asked to go boating with him and at first he laughs not in like a mocking way but just like a you're so silly type of way and then agrees that she can accompany him one day the next day he like hollers for her and at first she's really nervous but it's just because he wants to take her on the boat and they go in the boat and in general he's not being terrible and they fish and they catch a fish and they have the fish for dinner and he notices that she likes to collect little feathers and like bird nests and things while they're out so he gives her his old pack And while they're on the boat one day, she makes the mistake of like waving to Tate. And he's like, who is that? And she's like, oh, um, just a boy that Jody knew. And he's like, okay, well, be careful of people around here because you never know who you can trust. And she's like, okay, good point. And like, is like, whoops, I won't slip up on that again. On another day out, Pa lets his walls down a little bit and tells her about his family. Apparently they weren't always poor, but the depression got them and they had debts and everything kind of fell apart. And he just kind of mentions it offhand out of nowhere. And then he catches a really big fish and says, hey, hon, look, it's as big as Alabama. And she like is so happy. He called her hun. And it's so sad because it's so clear that Kaya, her only thing is that she wants to be like loved and cared for. And she's she clings so hard to this just simple word hun. But honestly, it's a really wholesome little chapter. Her father's not being terrible. It seems like he honestly like spending time with her and they're having a good time in the boat so far and it's going well almost too well but I'll take any heartwarming moment you know I'll take it It's 1969, and Chase's family comes to see him at the morgue to identify his body, which is a pretty morbid way to start this chapter. I know, I realize this. And anyway, it's his wife, Pearl, and his parents. They mention that the station, like the police station, is really gross. There's like mushrooms growing in the corner. Like, clean up the mushrooms, man. (laughs) What are you doing? But uh, it's confirmed that Chase died 
anywhere from midnight to 2 a.m. on October 30th. And there were no fingerprints at the scene. Like it was completely wiped. Like Chase's fingerprints weren't there. So they're pretty sure that there's foul play involved because there aren't any fingerprints like anywhere. Someone obviously wiped it. So it wasn't an accident. And they go to get food and the whole town is buzzing with news about this. And several people think that it was the Marsh Girl that did it. And we're back to some good times with Pa and Kaya in 1953 now because Kaya's seven, reminder. And Pa takes her in the boat to Jumpin's, which is a gas and bait shop, which is closer to their home. And he fills up on gas from Jumpin, who's like a black man who owns the store. And Jumpin calls Pa Jake. So that's his name. We haven't heard his name up until now. And Pa, obviously in a good mood and somehow has more money, takes Kaya with him to eat at a diner. They get lots of stares because Kaya is like, her hair is tangled and she's wearing coveralls and she's barefoot and that kind of thing. But they eat lots of yummy food. And while her father pays, she goes outside and this little girl walks up to her and holds out her hand to like shake it. And Kaya tries to shake her hand. And before before she can, this little girl's mom freaks out and tells her, you know, hey, don't touch this girl. She's dirty and picks her up and takes her home. And Kaya's like, oh, that's so sad. Like, obviously hurt by that statement. And then Pa comes out. He's like, hey, you ready to go? And they go home. And she mentions that Pa and her got along for a while. Like one time they played gin rummy together and they had a really good night. And while I was reading this, it just occurred to me that something writers do, which is irritating, but also really well done, <laughs> is that they tend to make me like characters that are just awful. Because the point of writing is to show, in my opinion, that people are really different. Like people just all around the world are different and they have bad sides and good sides. And like her dad is not someone that I ever want to meet. And yet in this couple chapters, she makes me like him. And I like... I don't appreciate that, but people aren't just good and evil. They have sides and they have moments in time where they make bad choices or do bad things. And so another writer that really makes me feel this way is Jessamyn Ward. And we'll be talking about one of her books later. But uh, the, the ability of writers to make me enjoy bad characters makes me very irritated. But I appreciate what they're trying to do. <laughs> Anyway, despite this effort on her part to make me like Pa, the next bit completely reminds me that he's a terrible person, as Kayo has a memory of Ma and abuse where her dad kind of throws her mom against a fridge and, like, hits Kaya's bottom with his belt and that kind of thing. And after this memory, she goes to the mailbox and finds a letter from her mom. She can't read because she never went to school, but she can tell her mom's handwriting because she's seen it before and she knows it's from her mom. She can't decide whether she should keep it herself or give it to her dad, but she's hoping, like, I'll never be able to read it. So she leaves it out for her dad to read and cooks and cleans. And when she sees him walking into the shack, she runs away because she's like, I don't want to deal with any fallout that might happen here, which was very smart on her part because he comes out looking just terrible and angry. And she goes back into the apartment and sees that he has burned her letter. So she never gets to read what was said on the letter. And she's so upset and she saves the pieces. And she has a fight with her pa about like him doing that. And he doesn't hit her, which is great, but he doesn't take her fishing anymore. And she has another memory about a terrible Easter they once had where all she remembers is church and blood, which is really upsetting. And in this moment, I remember thinking that the endings of every chapter are really good because they all make me want to know more. And this book is great in that each chapter is its own little perfectly formed like moment in time. And yet each chapter ends with something that makes me curious. And I think it's really well done. So anyway. Now we're on to 1969 again, and they go back to the scene to make sure they can't find any tire marks. The sheriff and his friend go back and look around, and they can't find anything. There's no treads from a car. There's no marks from where a boat would have put on, been put on shore. They look around everywhere, and they can only find the marsh. That's it. That's all they can find. And that's it for 1969. Now we flash back to 1956. I know that's a lot of numbers. Basically... 
Kaya is 10 now. It's been several years and Pa is leaving for longer periods of times. He's not giving her money anymore. And one day she realizes it's been almost a month since he's come back and she thinks he's gone. But she's happy at the fact that at least he left the boat this time. So she has a boat now. However, despite the fact that Pa is now gone, which is somewhat of a good thing, it's also somewhat of a bad thing because now there's definitely no chance of money. And she is more acutely aware of this that night when she lights their kerosene oil lamp and it runs out of oil. And she realizes that she has to buy oil. Otherwise, it's just her in the marsh in the dark. Like there's no light anywhere. They don't have electricity. So she needs to make money somehow. Like she needs to figure it out. This poor 10-year-old is by herself because everyone has left her and she doesn't know what happened to any of her family members and now has to figure out how to make money as a 10-year-old. And she has this idea. She decides she'll collect mussels and sell them to Jumpin. Do you remember Jumpin? He was the guy who owned the gas and bait store. And so she goes to him and she says, hey, can I sell you these? And he says, yeah, I buy a certain number of mussels a week. And I have several people who sell them to me. But if you beat them, I'll pay you for it. So here is 50 cents and some gas for your, you know, boat. And Jumpin seems like a really nice guy. He's like, hey, Miss Kaya, like, perfect. Let's get this going. Are we making a deal? And he seems really nice. And she can shop at Jumpin's, she realizes, because he has everything she needs. She doesn't have to go to the Piggly Wiggly anymore. She buys kerosene oil and candles and matches. And she really wants to buy some candy, but she knows that she shouldn't at all. And so when she gets home with all of her groceries, she realizes that Jumpin snuck in a little sugar daddy in for her. He must have noticed she was looking at the candy, which is super cute. One day, Kaya is boating around and sees Tate again. Every time she sees him, she starts seeing him more frequently. She just watches. So she hides somewhere and watches him. This is just kind of a chapter that flashes through some time of Kaya being on her own. And a lot of it is pointing out how she's different from the people around her. So when she sees Tate, she hides. She tries to fit into her mom's old dress and it doesn't fit her yet because she's 10. Uh, One day she's fishing and she hides because she sees Chase Andrews and some of his friends playing on the beach. And she sees a bunch of his like girl people who are with him all hanging out together and she realizes that she's jealous of girl friendships because she doesn't have that. She is all by herself in the marsh. Sadly, one day she doesn't get to jump ins on time and everyone else beats her to the muscles and she has no money. So she tries to come up with another idea. Jumpin is really apologetic, but he can't buy any more mussels. And so she comes up with another idea. She catches some fish and she smokes it and tries to sell it to Jumpin. And Jumpin says, okay, thanks, Miss Kaya. If someone buys these, I'll give you commission. And from this point, we switch to Jumpin's perspective or follow Jumpin for a minute. And we follow him home to a place called Colored Town, which is just a place full of shacks and lean-tos because I guess this is like 1956, but that still kind of sucks. And he shows the fish to his wife, Mabel, and they're both like, oh, no one's going to buy these fish. Like, it's this girl, Kaya, again. She's back. Like, we need to help her somehow. And his wife says, yeah, like, I'll talk to the church and see if we can get her anything. And the next day, when Kaya comes up to Jumpin's, she finds Mabel waiting, and they tell her that for the smoked fish, they will give her like clothes and things and donations. So Mabel measures her and her shoes and all that and gives her gas this week, even though she doesn't have any money. And Mabel gives her some tips on how to garden herself because Kaya has found some seeds. And then the next day after that, Kaya comes back and there's two full boxes full of food and clothes. And Kaya's like, this is way too much, like way more than the fish I gave you. And Jumpin's like, you have to take it. I have no room. And she's like, thank you. So Jumpin and Mabel are super, super sweet, like just decent people. Love them. Time flashes forward a bit to 1960 when Kaya's 14. One day while fishing, Kaya sees a boy in the brush just kind of walking around. She doesn't see who it is, but she sees some sort of boy and she hides because she's like, I don't know who that is. She like runs away. She obviously doesn't trust other people, doesn't want boys she doesn't know near her, which is honestly probably smart in the 50s. And so she runs away. But later, she walks by a stump, and in the stump, like stuck in it, 
is the eyebrow feather of a blue heron. And she figures it's from the boy because there's no possible way that this feather just like landed in the stump like that. And so she comes back the next day and finds there's a tail feather of a tropic bird. She says that she doesn't read, so she can't tell what species of birds there are, but she tries to draw them and she refers to them in their, her own way. And so this one is a tropic bird feather, which she also thinks is from this boy. And the next day, there's a tail feather of a wild turkey. And she has this memory of how once she came upon these turkeys that were killing this other turkey that was wounded. Because she mentions that in the wild, turkeys kill one of them that might cause predators to notice them. So they kill like one of their own to protect themselves. And on the heels of this frightening memory, we see Kaya one night at the shack by herself and some boys, presumably from Barkley Cove, the town, decide to walk up to her shack and she hears them and she hides in her shack, but there's no exit except the front door. And they come up to the front door and they're like, Marsh girl, Marsh girl, haha, where are you? And they're like, in general, being hoodlums. And she's terrified because she's 10 and by herself in this shack while boys accost her. And so it's this like memory of the turkeys where like maybe she believes that they're coming after her because she's not one of them and therefore is a risk to to them. That's the vibe that I get with the memory of the turkeys. Hey guys, I'm back. I uh, took a small break to eat some cake that rhymed and to have a cocktail. Can you hear it? I don't drink very often, but I am a fan of Di Serrano, which is amaretto, because it tastes like candy and I have a huge sweet tooth. So sorry for that little break here, but let's move on, shall we, to 1969. The sheriff has heard from the coroner or whoever does it that Chase definitely died from a fall. So he definitely fell through the gate or grate and then hit the floor. And then they also found that on his jacket were red wool fibers from some sort of like garment. And so if they find the red wool thing, they'll find whoever did this. Now I'm going to give you whiplash because we're back to 14-year-old Kaya in 1960. Kaya decides that now it's her turn to leave a gift for whoever's been leaving her these feathers. And she leaves a bald eagle tail feather from like an immature bald eagle. So he has to be an expert to know what it is. And that morning she cleans her house and cuts her hair for the first time since her mom left, which is like so long ago, like eight years ago. And then she's going through her mom's drawers and she finds some nail polish and she remembers a time where she and her mom and sisters got stuck in the mud in a boat after they painted their nails. And her mom made a point of saying that like girlfriends have to stick together and Kaya finds that she's sad and kind of lonely. She goes to the stump later and finds that there is a feather of a night heron, which is really rare, along with some seeds and a spark plug and a note that she can't read. That night, just to get a jump on things, she goes mussel hunting, which I guess is just reaching in water for mussels, and sells them to jump in. And the next day, she goes back to the stump to see if anything else is there, and Tate is there. He's the boy who's been giving her this stuff. She almost runs away, but he calms her down, and she gives him a swan feather that she found, and he offers to teach her to read when she mentions that she couldn't read his letter. Yay, someone will teach this girl how to read. So some of my impressions so far are that I really like the book. Like, so far, I'm really enjoying it. I love the characters. I love Tate. I love Kaya. I love how she feeds the goals. I love Jumpin'. Everyone is someone I really like, and I even like the way that she writes. I like that there's a murder case going on. It's keeping me really interested. And I don't know, I'm just, I have higher expectations for popular books like this, and I honestly didn't think I was going to like it as much as I did and find it as interesting as I did. But it was so fun to read. Like, I honestly feel this podcast, if you enjoy it, you should give this book a try because the writing is really well done. And I don't know if I can get that completely across to you here, but hopefully we can just have a nice story time together. So let's keep going. So Tate is a little busy at first and doesn't have a lot of time to teach Kaya how to read. So she decides to stop waiting around for him and instead do something nice for Jumpin because Jumpin's been so nice. So she makes some blackberry jam and she starts walking to quote unquote colored town to bring it to Jumpin. 
And on the way, she starts to hear voices, like boy voices. So she hides. She sees two boys walking along, and then she sees Jumpin also walking along. And she's a little confused because they're being rude and calling him names, and she doesn't know why he's taking it. Because remember, Kaya has grown up in Marsh and has not been around people. So, like, race isn't really, like, a thing for her. It obviously has to be a teeny bit because she knows that there's some stores who don't, like, let in black people and that kind of thing but like she obviously hasn't seen prejudice at work so she hasn't seen any of this before and she realizes that the boys are just they're escalating so they grab rocks and they start throwing them at jumpin jumpin's just walking along ignoring him and they grab more rocks and go to follow him and at this point kyle's like nah so she hits one of them on the head with her bag and knocks him out and then the other boy just runs away And she decides, next time, I just won't come here. I'm going home now. So obviously, that was enough human interaction for her that she felt uncomfortable with and then left. Um, This is an interesting scene because I like that she went to do something nice for Jumpin, but I wish that she had continued to go give him that blackberry jam because we didn't actually get to see her. She did something nice for Jumpin, like she hit the boys who were being mean, but hopefully that's not, she's not like saving him from anything, maybe mild harassment. And it would have been nice if she had, like, I would have liked to have seen the scene where she gives him some jam as a thank you. I just feel like that would have been really sweet, but this is also somewhat sweet in a way, like a little girl defends someone she cares about. So I appreciate that. After that scene, Kaya's reading lessons start. So Tate comes by and teaches her the alphabet and some words. And there's a really sweet scene where she didn't realize something that I'm going to read to you. He was patient, explaining the sound of the TH, and when she finally said it, she threw her arms up and laughed. Beaming, he watched her. Slowly, she unraveled each word of the sentence. There are some who can live without wild things, and some who cannot. Oh, she said. Oh, you can read, Kaya. There will never be a time again when you can't read. It ain't just that, she spoke almost in a whisper. I wasn't aware that words could hold so much. I didn't know a sentence could be so full. He smiled. That's a very good sentence. Not all words hold that much. Which is just an adorable scene, because words can't hold so much, you guys. I love it. Anyway, he comes back more and more often to teach her how to read, and she practices at night every night by her little oil lamp, and eventually they're feeding the goals, and she mentions, how do you count past 29? Because I guess that's her highest number, and he says, oh, after that is 30, and he teaches her some basic math. And there's a really cute scene where she finally can read the Bible that her mom left there that has the birth dates and names of all her siblings, which is just a really sweet thing to look at. It also has the name of her parents, Jackson and Julianne. And then the story, independent of Kaya, tells us a little history about her parents and how they met. Jake met Maria, so supposedly she goes by her middle name, Maria, one day just in a a diner. And then the depression happened and just totally tore Jake's life apart. One time in the night, he stole a bunch of family heirlooms from his parents and grandparents and then bought a ton of stuff to woo Maria and took her to really fancy places and asked her to marry him and she said yes. He worked for his father-in-law at a shoe company because Maria had quite a bit of money but he wasn't promoted because his father-in-law didn't want to promote him just because of nepotism and he was kind of lazy. He took night classes and they lived in a garage apartment, but he also partook in poker and alcohol. And over the course of six years, they had four kids. And eventually he was called to war, where in the middle of a battle, his sergeant was like hurt. And a bunch of the men jumped up to help him, except Jake, who stayed there frightened. And then he was hurt by a mortar. And everyone assumed he had gotten hurt saving the sergeant. So he got released and was given a medal. And only he's the one who knows that he was actually being a coward, which is super heavy. After he got back from the war, he sold all of Maria's nice things, moved them to a shack that was his dad's old fishing cabin. So, ugh. And they had one last child in the shack, Kaya. It mentions that Jake sometimes thought about finishing up school and being a better person, but alcohol and poker always came back into his mind, which I thought was a nice way of seeing alcohol as an addiction. So that's very cool that she put that in. Although, oof, that's just rough. So 
what a rough thing. Like her poor mom went from being a really, you know, well-to-do lady to living on a shack in the marsh. Uh, no wonder she left, although she probably should have taken her eight-year-old daughter with her, but that might just be my opinion. So one day Kaya goes to Jumpin and Jumpin mentions that some social services people were out here asking around her and he told them that her pa was still around and not to worry because he knows that she doesn't want to be picked up. She begins lessons again with Tate, but now she's paranoid. So they do it at another cabin that she calls the reading cabin, which is a little further from the shack. So she continues her lessons and learnings there and she learns poems and Tate brings her textbooks and she eats inside with him one night in the shack for the very first time. He sees her like collection of specimens, which is really cute. And one day she goes to jump in and Mabel warns her that like, if you need me anytime, let me know, which is amazing timing because on her next reading lesson with Tate, she begins to have a stomach ache and she realizes that it's like a period of some kind and Tate is there and reassures her about it and says, it's okay, it's natural, it's fine. Like, I'll take you home and we don't have to talk about it again. And she is mortified and she goes to Jumpin's place and says, please get Mabel here. And Jumpin, adorable, walks home like two miles to get his wife. And his wife comes like two miles and gives her hugs and tells her, it's okay, it's natural, like you're a woman now, yay. She is so mortified that the next time Tate comes for a reading lesson, she hides and she's not sure she's going to come out. But he goes, I brought cake. And he's, she's like, oh, yay, cake. And they eat cake together. And they never talk about it again, which is super adorable that he did that. And they have some more heart to hearts during their lesson where Tate tells her how his mom and sister died because they were going into town to get him a gift and they died in a car crash, which is super sad. They uh, take that moment from being super sad to like trying to catch leaves, which is really cute. And then they kiss and she asks if she's his girlfriend. And he says, you might be too young because newsflash, did you know that she's 14 and he's a senior in high school, which makes him like 18, which I don't know, Delia Owens, that's kind of gross. You couldn't have made them closer. Like she is literally a minor and he is so not like... Hmm, it's a little gross there, but maybe that's just me. I don't know. Maybe for the 50s, it was like acceptable. I don't know. But anyway, reading lessons after that are all flirty and they race around and they like joke together and general be like flirty, flirty people. And one day he shows up to her place with in his boat, a little picnic basket, and he takes her to a little bluff and says, happy birthday, Kaya, you're 15 today because he read in her Bible when her birthday was and he gives her some presents he gives her a magnifying glass to look at her specimens and a barrette and he gives her some paints because she likes to paint everything in the marsh that she collects which is super sweet after this we get a look into tate's life a little bit and scupper has an awkward conversation where he says look i'm so proud of you for going to college please don't get a girl pregnant and it's really awkward <laughs> But Tate is like, look, okay, I, it's going to be fine. And he and Kaya hang out more. Kaya loves biology. She's getting so smart. Christmas comes around and they spend it together. Tate brings leftovers and they cook it and they eat together. And they start to get a little bit more like make out -y. And they have several moments where like they're making out and she freezes because he's a lot older than him. And he's always really nice about it. And one time she doesn't freeze, but he does. And he says, look, it's not going to be this way. Like, like, we have to wait. And he says that, you know, just to warn you, I am going to college soon because I want to be a biologist. And she's like, no, don't leave. Everyone leaves. And he's like, I have to. Like, this is my dream. And she's so scared. And the next day he comes by and he says, I'm actually leaving earlier than I thought. So this is goodbye. And she's like, what? And she's so scared because she is so, so scared that he'll just forget about her and never come back. And she's so lonely here. And he says, look, I promise that won't happen. On July 4th, I will come to the beach and we'll spend July 4th together. I'll come back from college. And she says, okay. 
So we flash forward to July 4th, 1961, where I believe she's 16 now because she just turned 15 like the previous year. So she's 16-ish and she waits on a beach for Tate on July 4th and he doesn't show up. She swims around in the ocean a little bit. She waits a little longer. She watches some fireflies and she goes inside. There is a running theme or metaphor of fireflies in this novel that's kind of important. I honestly think that the firefly like metaphor gets lost a little in Delia's writing because there's so much nature in it that it's hard to be like, oh, she keeps mentioning fireflies because she also mentions gulls and and frogs and feathers all the time. But it's hard to see symbolism in one aspect of this entire nature world. And there's more than just that, but there is stuff about fireflies. So I'll read you a little excerpt here. Each species of firefly has its own language of flashes. As Kaya watched, some females signaled dot dot dash flying a zigzag dance, while others flashed dash dash dot in a different dance pattern. The males, of course, knew the signals of their species and flew only to those females. Then, as Jody put it, they rubbed their bottoms together like most things did so they could produce young. Suddenly, Kaya sat up and paid attention. One of the females had changed her code. First, she flashed the proper sequence of dashes and dots, attracting a male of her species and they mated. Then she flickered a different signal and a male of a different species flew to her. Reading her message, the second male was convinced he'd found a willing female of his own kind and hovered above her to mate. But suddenly the female firefly reached up, grabbed him with her mouth, and ate him, chewing all six legs and both wings. Kaya watched others. The females got what they wanted, first a mate, then a meal, just by changing their signals. Kaya knew judgment had no place here. Evil is not in play, just life pulsing on, even at the expense of some of the players. Biology sees right and wrong as the same color and different light. She waited another hour for Tate and then finally walked toward the shack. So the firefly thing keeps going on throughout the book. I only noticed it once I was done, really. Um, and I'll talk more about it at the end in our discussion in the next episode. But I just thought that excerpt I would tell you since we were there. Anyway, on the next day, she again waits on the beach heartbroken and Tate does not show up. She spends days in bed thinking about how everyone has left her, and the only thing that finally gets her up is this cooper hawk that sits outside her porch bed. And so she eventually goes, oh, well, that's a really nice hawk, and finally shows interest in something. And then she goes to the gulls who haven't seen her in days, and they surround her, and she cries, and it's really sad. And she stays at home for a month, doesn't go to jump in or gets gas or goes anywhere, just stays at home for a month. She avoids people because she decides that she can't trust them. And she, when she does start going out, she talks to jump in less. Occasionally, the hawk visits, and she calls him Coop. And she grows her collection and her loneliness. And this lasts for a year and then two more years. And she's hurt and heartbroken and lonely this whole time. And she ends part one around the age of 19 with a broken heart. So that's part one. Can you believe that? Thank you for sticking around and for doing this in pieces with me. I really appreciate it. It's nice because I get to go a little slower with this and I knew I would want to read you guys excerpts and I knew that would take time. So I think you'll really enjoy part two because things get crazy. I did not know that this book was going to go where it did. And part one is so like not peaceful, but you know what to expect in terms of her growth and the nature and the land and the people in her life. And part two just throws a curveball at you. So I think I'll really enjoy talking about it with you guys later this week. Thank you for tuning in. As always, if you enjoyed us on the podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes and Spotify. It really helps my numbers and helps me get noticed by more people. If you want more Bad Book Club, you can follow us on our social media at Bad Book Club Pod on everything. And if you want to support the podcast, you could go to my website and buy some of the books that I talk about and at the same time support a local bookstore because we all know they need it. Thank you so much. You guys are wonderful. And I'll see you later this week for part two of Where the Crawdads Sing. And we'll talk a lot then. So goodbye, lovelies. Stay awesome.